thank you for coming. I mean, thank you for coming a day after day after day after day. And this is the last day. So uh, one, uh, one final example that I wanted to discuss that will, will be interesting, in my opinion, for several reasons, comes from discrete, it's a problem in discrete geometry, so-called fourth degree problem. Uh, the fourth degree problem asks, I give you a set of points in the plane, and I promise that there is no line that contains more than three points. And the question is, how large of a subset can you find which is in general position, meaning there are no three points in the line? So from no four points in the line, you want to remove some points to, to get a set of points which is in general position. And we're, we want to study this quantity. Uh, so more precisely, a given a set of points uh, are defined, sorry, for P, uh, a set of points in the plane, F of P is going to be the largest size of a set P prime, which is a subset of P, and P prime is in so called general position. The general position means you no know, three points. On the line. So well, every time we take a two point, we draw a line through them, but no other point of the set will, will lie uh, on this line. And we're interested in finding a large subset of a P prime in, in every P. So, of course, if P itself is in general position, then we just can keep all the points, but we're asking about the worst case example. So the set where this of n points where this will be the smallest possible. So further, f of n, now n is an integer, it's the uh, smallest value of f of p, where p is the set of points of order n. And no, no point in the ah, right. Yeah, of course. So, uh, thanks. And uh, P has no four points in a line. I mean, of course, if we took all of the points in P collision, then the answer would be two and so yeah, two and and this will be over. But we all we also look, we only look at sets that have no four points in a line. And an exercise is to show that f of n is at least of order square root of n. And even okay, you can put a constant two here and the hint to show so the exercise. It will be to show that f of n choose two is in fact at least n minus n, and from which the bounds yeah, the bound follows. So I want yeah, I won't spoil the fun here. <laughs> the hint is enough, enough of the hint. So we know that this function is somewhere between square root of n and n. So we already have some non-trivial lower bounds. Now, uh, what about an upper bound? Uh, an upper bound, since this is a, a minimum, it's just enough to construct exa an example of a set which doesn't have any large subset, uh, which is in general position. And it's not, it's not an easy problem. And the first progress was and so this was, I think, some question uh, going back to earlier, and the first progress was due to Zoltan Kureli, uh, who gave a, kind of a very, very elegant argument, which you can say inspired all the work on the problem that followed. So 
uh, what Spurani did is he proved that at least this function is sublinear. F of n is is little o of n, and his proof observed that such a bound follows from the so-called density version of the Hales dual theorem. So what does the, the Hales Jewett theorem say? The Hales Jewett theorem without the density part says that if you take um, the set of integers one up to k and you fix some number r, which is you, this is the number of colors. You take the set of integers one to k and consider the n the k by k by k by k n dimensional grid. So the Hayes Jewett theorem says take the set one up to k, take a product of itself some n times, and now no matter how we color this with our colors, if n is at least as large as some function of r, then in one of the colors we'll have something which is called combinatorial line. It's a set of k points of the form. So here we could say one seven star, two star. And the numbers that I wrote, so k points where we just substitute simultaneously for or the stars numbers one, two, three up to k. So this will be it's a line which is one seven one two one, one seven two two two, one seven three two three, one seven four two four, and so on. And the density has to it versions says that you don't need to color because you will find them in the densest color class. Meaning if I just keep and one over r proportion of this, I will already find the line. Now, how does it imply this bound? I will take k equals three and r will be some very large number. So now if I keep a one over k r proportion of this three to the n, then I will find a combinatorial line. A combinatorial line is, um, is a line which contains, it's a particular a geometric line which contains three points. However, this set doesn't contain any four on a line because it's a three by three by three grid. So no matter how you intersect it with the line, you will at most get three points. In other words, in very high number of dimensions, we found a set of size three to the n, so that if you keep one over our proportion of it, then you will see three points on the line, which means that the larger subset of it that doesn't contain three on the line is at most of size one over r, or strictly less than one over r. And kind of to prove this little of n, you need to take r to infinity. The only issue is that we produce a set with high dimensions and we ask for a set on the plane, but there's a standard trick, it will be one of our exercises. If you manage to construct the example in any number of dimensions, then you can just take a random projection and it won't introduce any new collinearities. What's the argument? More or less clear if you if you didn't follow it completely, I it's kind of not what I want, not the main thing was I, that I want to prove today because we'll prove a much stronger bound. Uh, and the number of dimensions will be always at most three. So don't be scared of, of the end. But the kind of the general idea is to construct an example in a larger number of dimensions and then project to the plane. If we project it in a generic way and the set of points is finite, this will not introduce any new polarities. And the theorem is proof I want to sketch today is due to Yoshi Balon and Yoshi Shoimoshi.
from 2018 uh, to prove a bound which is polynomial in N, M to five over six plus some little of one. So this Fn is between N to one half and N to five six and it's unclear what's, what the right power is. So I think this bound, which since I gave it as an exercise, it's, you can assume that it's not very difficult, uh, but it hasn't been significantly improved further. And also this is the, the state of the art. Is this is the statement here and was was the sketch somewhat understandable? Okay, so now how are we going to prove it or how did they prove it? And they proved it by kind of following the general idea of uh, of of this proof, however, with some kind of obvious uh, Modification obvious differences. The idea is still to start with the construction in a higher number of dimension, uh, but it's enough actually to look at uh, three dimensions. And their idea was let's take a random subset R of a Three dimensional grid. So M cubed. Now, the problem is that this three dimensional grid contains now many uh, lines with four points or five points up, up to M points. But if we take this random subset sufficiently sparse, then the number of collinear four tuples will not be too large. Uh, if, and if it's not larger than the number of points in this random set, then we can just remove one point from, from each collinear port apple uh, to get a set with no four on the line. Uh, so uh, this set will have density m roughly one over n, n to minus one plus root of one, and at this density, the number of collinear four tuples in R again, is of the same order of magnitude than the number of points. So if we can make it even slightly smaller, then in fact, most points in the set will not be involved in any collinear four tuples. So we can just clean it by arbitrarily removing. This is exactly the same thing as we did when we showed that, say, Turan's theorem is does not fall for triangles below one of the square root of that. It's the same principle. So arbitrarily remove one point. I, I will, of course, show you that this, uh, this is possible. One point from every collinear, I'm ah, sorry, collinear or double. In R, and this way we will get the set R prime whose number of points is at least half, say, the number of points of R. So this will be the kind of the, the easy part. And the second step also. And we will show that the largest size of a, a set subset of R in general position is at most M to the power five thirds plus little or one. But since R prime is a subset of R, then of course, 
this is also an upper bound of f of r prime yeah, because every set of points i'm uh, sorry other, in, in the other direction yeah and if every set of subset of r prime in general position is also of course a subset of r in general position and will be able to bound it efficiently now what is the size of r the size of r is it's one over n proportion of mq so it's uh, i can divide this uh, exponent by two and this is how we get the exponent by six now this is the part which is not too difficult and this is the part uh, which is harder here we just did some fairly simple calculation and we'll prove this part using the hypergraph container here. So just to kind of before I dive into the computation, how is the hypergraph container theorem related here? Well, take my look at this set n cubed. It's a set of n cubed points in R3. The things that we're interested in are a triples of points that are collinear. So I can define a hypergraph on the set N cube whose edges are all points, collinear triples of points. What is F of R? It's the largest size of a point set in a general position, which is just the independence number of this hypergraph induced by the random set R. So what we would like to do is we're given some hypergraph and we are looking at a random subset of its vertices and we're trying to bound the largest size of an independent set. Now, if you think about it, this is precisely what we did when we studied Mantel's theorem. We have a hypergraph of triangles in the complete graph. We take a random subset of the hyper vertices, which is the edges of the complete graph, and we're trying to bound from above the largest size of a triangle free graph, which is an independent set in this hypergraph. So it's in kind of in, a high, in high level, this is exactly the same thing that we're doing. It's just here, this hypergraph comes from a, a geometric setting rather than graph view. And now let's kind of stay, keep comparing it to what we've done so far. So we can, we, we calculate it at kind of for what, what is the smallest collection of containers that we can use here. And this was some calculation about how many triangles are there in the complete graph, how many triangles that contain an edge, how many triangles that contain a pair of edges and so on. So we will do similar things here. However, the key ingredient there was to say that if we have a subgraph of KM, which is slightly more than half of the edges of KN, then it must contain many triangles. And this allowed us to characterize the, the, the container sets, meaning sets which at most epsilon and cube triangle. So in order to uh, kind of get any foothold in this problem, we have to understand uh, how many collinear triples are we forced to have in any set which uh, has kind of some significant size because the conclusion would be okay. Let's suppose that we find a collection of containers for, for this hypergraph, and then we know that every container is sparse. So, so it corresponds to some subset of this grid which has few collinear triples. So at least we would like to know that it's not, not too large, or in contrapositive, if it's large and it contains many collinear triples. And kind of this brings me now. now uh, we'll have to kind of do some calculations and prove a super saturation theorem for the subsets of the grid. And this will be the geometry part of the proof. And then there will be the probabilistic part of the proof where we use the geometric or, or combinatorial information to derive something about the number of containers and about the size of the containers. So this is, uh, this is the plan.
disagrees. So yeah, means the part that uh, the original property is uh, as square in two dimension. How yes. do you go from three Ah, okay. So now, great. Uh, let me say how to move from three dimensions to two dimensions, and this is kind of a a, a simple trick exercise. If I don't want to talk about something, I just put, uh, put it as an exercise. And suppose that Q is a subset of, of the three dimensional space, uh, which is finite. But, and uh, let pi be a be the orthogonal projection orthogonal projection of Q to a random hyperplane through the origin. And now the exercise has proved that whenever you take three points in Q, X, Y, Z in Q, that are not on a line, meaning in general position, then the probability that their images they are collinear is not only small, it's actually zero. And what do I mean a hyper random hyperplane through the origin? You just take uh, the units here in three dimensions and you take a, a point in it uniformly at random. So this gives you a direction and you uh, project on this uh, orthogonal hyperplane. So this goes for every part of the cube, right? For and then you're right. For if if Q is even countable, then you can just union bound. So the, so okay, we got our set R prime, which is in three dimensions. Then you just randomly project it to the hyperplane, and you get a, a set in two dimensions. Okay, so this was the kind of this was the warm up, and let's now prove a super saturation statement for three linear couples in subsets of the grid. So the question is, I get I, I, we are given a larger subset of the grid, and what can we say? How can we argue that, that there must be still many collinear three couples, and if the argument is, is, is not surprising, it's, it's a similar type of argument that we use for the triangles. Uh, meaning what we did for the triangles, we said, take a look at this large graph and now pick a small subset of the vertices and then say, okay, this set is large also on average in this small subset of the, this, sorry, this graph is many edges on average in this small set of vertices. So th there must be at least one triangle or at least some small number of triangles. However, the probability that we caught a triangle was small, so the number of triangles get multiplied. And here, instead of covering uh, kind of the grid with, with smaller, smaller grids, what we will do is we will, Pick a direction and then cover the set of the grid by all the 
lines which are parallel to and, and go in this direction. And if in a line, then we're sure that if this line contains at least these three points, then we'll be able to find many collinear triples because the fact that we're looking at the line intersected with, with our set, every subset of the line gives a collinear triple in, uh, in the set. And then we'll do it for, for all the directions and add the collinear triples because, of course, if the triples that we get for different directions must be different triples because the three points already, any two of them define the direction. So there will be some short discussion about which of the directions are important, because of course, can a generic line will, for a generic direction, um, the, 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 the line, a line would meet uh, this discrete set of points in, in maybe uh, zero or one points. So we need to also carefully choose the set of, set of directions. So H will be a three uniform hypergraph <clears throat> on M cubed whose edges are collinear triples. And definition if for a line, so I'll denote lines by this script little l for a line that intersects the, the grid, uh, integer grid in at least two points. Uh, let's let S of L and B its direction. And formally, uh, SL is one of the two shortest vectors in the set L minus L. So if we have a line which contains some number of points on the integer grid, its direction is either this vector or the reverse vector. And we call SL the direction. So it's defined up to, up to the side. And the key fact is the following. If some line intersects this grid in many points, then it must be that the direction of the line must have small L infinity norm. So if the intersection of L with M cubed is strictly larger than K, then the direction, which is a vector, its largest coordinate is no more than M over K in absolute value. And moreover, L, when we intersect it, there must be some point which is close to the boundary of this box, meaning it's called one at least one of its partners must be either close to zero or close to n. So and this contains a point uh, whose coordinate whose uh, at least one coordinate is either. smaller than at most m over k or at least m minus m over k.
Is is the fact clear? Can you explain that again? Sure. So here's I mean, let me do it in two dimensions. The argument in three dimensions is, is, is identical. Suppose that you have um, you know, a, a line which has some large intersection with the grid. What is the direction of the line? In fact, the direction of the line is the, the difference between two adjacent. So if you order the points along the line, SL is the difference between two adjacent points. So if you fit in a, a lot of these points here, they form a, 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 continu a continuous sub-interval of this. And since you managed to squeeze a lot of points, but the, and no coordinate here as you pass could have changed by more than M because the, the range is one to M. And if you manage to start with a point in here and finish with a point in here, it means that no coordinates change by n. It means that every coordinate of this vector can be at most m, or in fact, at most m minus one. So this shows uh, the first assertion. And for the second assertion, if you have such a line that you know intersects that has um, n infinity norm m over k, then if you're at a point which is not close to the boundary, whose distance from the boundary is more than m over k, then you can just make one more step without exiting the box, which means that the last line, sorry, the last point uh, on this line one of its coordinates must be smaller, either smaller than the L infinity norm of SL or larger than M minus the L infinity norm. SL otherwise would just make an SL step in one of the directions and still stay in the box. So this, just this last point, when you make this step, you have to go outside, which means that one of the coordinates must have been closer to the boundary than the L infinity norm of that. It was that okay? So L of S it will be the set of all lines L whose direction is S and that are relevant for our problem. So they, there's infinitely many such lines, but we're only interested in the ones that have at least one point in MQ because otherwise uh, we will not look at that. And K of S is among all these lines, uh, we look at the one that intersects uh, our cube in the most points. So the corollary would be uh, first of all, we have an upper bound on L of S in terms of this parameter K of S. So take any line in direction S. This is the, there is a line in this direction which intersects the cube in K of S points. 
If it intersects the cube in K of S points, then it means that it's L infinity norm of S is at most M over K. And also, it must, at least one of the coordinates of some point in the line in the box must have be close to the boundary. Now, how can I find this line? Let's specify first a point which is close to the boundary. And then um, the um, so let me uh, let me write the bound. So we specify first. Ah, so it's just the number of lines in this direction through the cube. So since I know the direction to know which line I'm talking about, it's enough for me to specify one point. And I, I'm certain that there is one point which is close to the boundary, and it will give me give me this line. So this is at most. I choose the the, the coordinates that are not small, and I have m squared possibilities, but there's one coordinate which is close to the boundary, so a factor of two, either it's close to m or close to zero, and the value of the coordinate which is close to the boundary. And this is 6m cubed divided by k of x. And the second part is what is the number of directions where in which some line intersects the cube in at least k points? And well, we know that the L infinity norm is at most m over k. So each coordinate is between minus m over k and m over k. <clears throat> so we get the bound of twice m over k cubed. So now I see maybe a simpler way of, of seeing this would be how many lines are there that, uh, no, sorry, I, I take it back. Actually, I get confused. So LS is the number of lines in direction S, right? Yes. And the right hand side seems to be, it's only the subset that has maximum section. It, but every such line, so we know that every such line, so since one such line intersects the set in k points, it means that the, the vector SL needs to have small, co small coordinates, at most m over k. But for every such line, sorry, now I should have argued more, for every such line which is is, whose vector has small coordinates will at some point be close to the boundary. Because if it's far from the boundary, you can make one step. It has to be close to the boundary, even if it meets the, the set in, in a single point. And the the lemma which will finish the first part of the proof and then we'll go for a break is that is the, the number of collinear four tuples <laughs> in n cubed is at most 50 n to the six times log n. Know that it's kind of significantly better than what one could prove. One could, I, I could try to give a bound in the following way. If I have some collinear four tuple, then I can get the line by giving n to the six points, n to the six uh, counting, one point n cubed, the second point n cubed, 
and then two other points on this line. But this line would have as many as m squared points. So, so as n points, then I would have to pay m squared. I would get an amount of m to the eight. However, the whole point of this discussion is that the, that the lines that intersect the cube in very many points are very rare. So if you take two random points, then the um, on according to this, on average, you will intersect uh, this grid in at most square root of log n points because you will pay only log n for getting the two extra points. So, so trivial is only of order n to the end. So here's the calculation. Let's count the four doubles. Now, these are all the possible directions. And these are all the possible lines in this direction. And once we see a line in a given direction, then we exactly know how many four doubles are there. This is their number. So let's group the lines <clears throat> by their intersection with M. So let's now consider now all the directions where the largest line that intersects the grid intersects it in exactly K points. And here, let's upper bound, maybe every line or most lines intersected in exactly K points. And then we have a factor of K choose four. Let's change the sum to a dyadic sum. So let's group the k from 4 to 8, 9 to 16, and or 4 to 7, 8 to 15, and so on. So this is at most. So this is right at most. The sum if i from 2 to log base 2 of m, and then sum over all s. Now with k of s is between 2 to the i and 2 to the i plus 1. And we get 2 to the i plus 1 choose s. And now we're interested in how many lines are there whose k of s is between 2 to the i and 2 to the i plus 1. But we know that this number, so this, the size of L of s, well, it's at most 6 m cubed divided by k to the s minus 1. So this is at most 6 m cubed divided by 2 to the i minus one. Uh, okay, now, sorry, this was two to the i, I'm sorry, two, uh, choose four. Uh, now, two to the I choose four. Uh, is at most two to the four I plus four. And Okay, sorry, one second. 
we still need right sorry we still need to count how many s's are there whose k of s is at least two to the i uh, but we said that the number of such of such s's is at most twice m over k cubed so the size of this sum is twice m over two to the i cubed. So now we have two to the four i, three times two to the i, and another two to the i. So the only thing that survives is m cubed and m cubed, and the sum of logarithmic length. So this will be big O of m to the six times log m. And maybe this would be a, a good time for, for a break. Okay, let me uh, let me continue. So uh, we have this bound on the number of collinear portables, and it already solves the first question we had because we said we will form now R. A, a random subset of the integer grid by keeping each point uh, randomly independently uh, with probability P, which is uh, M to minus one minus little over one. Now, what is the probability? So the expected side of R is, of course, P and Q. But now, what is the expected number of collinear portables? In R. Well, we have at most n to the six log m of them. Maybe times some constant. However, we keep each port up with probability only p to the four, because we, we must have uh, kept all four points in the random set. And now this is, say if I say that it's p is n to minus one minus epsilon, then this size is m to two minus epsilon. However, this is m to two m squared times log m, but we get to put minus four epsilon, which means that the expected number of polynomial four tuples is much, much smaller than the expected number of points, which means that typically, if I take a typical sample, then I'll be able to remove just a negligible proportion of the points and, and have a point with no four on the line. So typically, if R contains subset of size, say at least P and Q over two with no four on the line. And let's and this will be our subset R prime. And the most difficult part now is to show that R doesn't contain any large subset with a no three on the line. Um, Unfortunately, I already see that I won't be able to get through all the details. So it's something that was supposed to be a lemma. I will just turn it into an exercise. And the exercise is the following. Suppose that you're given a subset of the grid of size at least 100 times n squared. 
uh, elements. And the conclusion is that for some absolute constant C, the, the number of collinear triples that you will find there is at least C times A cubed over M to the six. And the, the proof you need to use covering by lines in and in our families L of S for all S for which a K of S is somewhat large. Plus convexity of the binomial coefficient x to three. So I can choose the direction and cover cover the set A with all lines in this direction. And this way, I see every point exactly one because two lines in the same direction don't meet anywhere. And if the intersection of this line with A has uh, some p points. Or not P, say R points, then you see R choose three collinear couples. And you will see the fewest if the covering will be uniform by convexity of the binomial coefficient. But in this calculation, of course, will take me too much time. And uh, I want to, so I will assume it for now. And finish the proof using this as a black box statement. So it's it's not difficult, but it takes it takes some work. But kind of deep down, it's just an averaging argument. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me. The definition of H. Ah, what is H? So H are all the collinear three tuples, and this is the all the collinear. So this is collinear three tuples, only involving uh, the points in A. Uh, now, uh, we view H as a hypergraph and would like to apply the container lemma to this hypergraph. And because a set without collinear three tuples is an independent set in here, and we'd like to build containers for independent sets. And the idea would be if a set R has a large subset without collinear three tuples, meaning a large independent set, then it means it must intersect one of the containers in at least as many points as the size of this independent set. So it's in our interest to build few containers for independent sets, which are small. And for this, the existence of a family of containers kind of only depends on the number of edges in the hypergraph, vertices in the hypergraph, but also the degrees in the hypergraph. So what is delta two of this hypergraph H? So I pick two points. How many collinear three tuples can two points be? It is most M because the longest line has, has length N there. Now, what about uh, delta three? It's one. And at delta one, well, here, unfortunately, delta one will be a, a little more complicated. 
uh, because kind of the only trivial bound that we have is even worse. So if I take A to be all the elements, so which is n cubed, then I will get only order n cubed and a collinear uh, three tuples. And uh, we will need uh, uh, we will need some uh, some better bound. Uh, but suppose that we do get some bound here, and I am able to apply the lemma. Unfortunately, the way that the lemma works uh, will be to say that I get to cover by containers such that each of them contains only say 1% of the three tuples. So even in, in the best of worlds, first I know that all independent sets are contained in N cubed. I will get a small family of containers, C1, oh sorry, A1, A2, up to some A AS, for S is maybe A T, and each of them has size maybe N cube over a thousand. However, if you look now at a random intersection of your set with any of these containers, then you expect a one over a thousand proportion, and we want to get something polynomially small. Now, what to do with it? And the idea is to, to iterate, to recurse, meaning instead of treating this as the final container, I can say, let's now look at the triples in this set. And by the lemma here, we still have plenty of them. And now we can further build another round of containers for the independent set in, in this set. And now we may begin another factor of one over a thousand. Then if this is still fairly large, then according to this lemma, so we can say things if the size of A is at least of order M squared, I can try, try to apply the lemma and construct even smaller containers. Now, kind of how does it work? I start with an independent set. I can I know it's contained in the cube, so it must be contained in one of the containers. Suppose that it's contained in this container. Now here I look only at the three tuples that involve the points in A, but I is contained in A. So I can again pretend that I didn't do this. I still have some hypergraph, which is now putting the three tuples in A and build a collection of containers for it and kind of the set I just falls down the street and at every level I gain a factor of say one over a thousand on the size of A. So after at most logarithmically uh, many iterations, I already gained something polynomial. And uh, we will stop if the final size is at most m, which is now will be m to the power uh, seven. So it's seven over three, uh, eight over three. Why eight over three? Because we want a bound of, of m to five thirds. So the expected, and we're keeping things probably to one over n, so the expected intersection here will be of size n to eight over three minus one, which is five over three. So again, kind of the idea is to iterate, we say, we apply it once and we get containers on your size, maybe one over a thousand. However, since we have a bound on the number of triples in every set of size, which is quadratic, then, this hypergraph is still pretty, has lots of edges. So we check, verify that the conditions of the theorem hold on from here, and we can, we can iterate. And then we iterate again, we iterate again, and we do it 
uh, log n times. Now, the question is what happened to the final number of, of containers? Well, the theorem says that whenever you break it down, the number is at most exponential in this parameter B, which we will see when we verify these conditions. Now, the number of final containers is just the number of paths in this tree. Since the degree going down will be always at most B times log M, and the depth is log M, then the number of leaves here will be only exponential B log M squared. So we will only pay an extra log M factor, but since the accuracy here is M, M to the epsilon, then this log M is, is irrelevant. Was the idea more or less clear? So to implement it, there's still kind of one thing uh, that uh, I need to address here is we know how to bound uh, the delta two and we know how to bound the delta three, but how to bound this maximum degree? I mean, this was bounding the average degree from from below is pretty difficult. And we need to kind of, when we apply the theorem, the condition says that the maximum degree should be roughly of the same order as the average degree, because the, the assumption of the theorem is, is this for some constant K. So we would like to check, not only that this is true here, but this is true every time we, we recursively invoke the theorem, sorry. And so this will be the final thing maybe I will say. Uh, because it's, it's, an, it's an idea that kind of goes back to, to the work of Robert Morris and David Saxton from about counting graphs without even cycles. And it kind of, it's a trick that, that keeps reappearing in, in applications of this. And I think it, it's, it's, nice to, it's nice to know if, you, if you're ever thinking of using the method. And uh, let me state it as a lemma. If A has at least 200 M squared elements, then when we look at the collinear triples in A, we can find some sub collection. So sub hypergraph H A which still has many edges. So it still has ah sorry, I I misspoke here and made the exercise too easy. Still has at least this many edges, but the degree, the maximum degree is at most six times the number of edges divided by the number of vertices. It could be that the maximum degree of the original thing is, is very, very large. And this would kind of kill our argument. However, this is enough because now every independent set in here 
is also independent in here. So instead of building containers for independent sets here, I can build containers for independent sets in here, which are also containers for the independent sets in here, because every set is independent here, will be independent here. And if I have containers for independent sets in here, then there are also containers for independent sets in here. So let me write it. Since the, in the, every set is independent in this hypergraph, is also independent in each of its hypergraphs, then this implies that containers <coughs> for the smaller one are in us. So the delta two and delta three will use the same. Yeah. Number. So they, right, delta two. And, so delta three, of course, will be the same for every non-empty guy. But delta two, I will use the same because, of course, now delta two of H A is its most delta two of A because it's a sub hypergraph. <coughs> but kind of this is not the bottleneck for choosing the parameters. So here I don't have to be. I don't have to be very precise. I can, for the type of bound I'm, I'm using, I can get away with that. But it's important to build something whose maximum degree is at most the average degree. And uh, here, this is very helpful. And the idea is, let me first explain the idea before I write the computation. The idea is actually, you know, very natural and and you might even say silly. Here's the set A, and this super saturation. You see, I deliberately wrote two hundred here, and whereas here we have one hundred, which means now that if I look at any half of the subset it will still have very many edges. <laughs> and now we will do the following. This whole set A has many edges. So let's pick one. And there's some, sorry, I still haven't divided anything. There's one edge, so I add it to my hypergraph. And then I take, I have many, so I have many besides even this one. So I take another one and another one and another one and so on. And as I add the edges one by one, perhaps some vertex already gets close to its degree gets large. And I wouldn't like to further add any edges that contain its vertex because I might violate this condition. So let me put it aside. I put aside one vertex. So I still have a, a large subset of A. So I keep finding edges and then the degrees of, of some vertices are getting close to my bound, so I just put them aside in a set X. As long as X is less than a half of the set, then uh, this exercise guarantees me that I keep finding edges that don't touch the set X. So if I found enough edges, I'm happy. The only thing that might have gone wrong is that at some point, my X was became larger than A over two. And I can no longer invoke this. But if X got larger than A over two, then let's calculate now the sum of all the degrees of the vertices in X. Well, surely since the graph is three uniform, we didn't count any edge more than three times by the hypergraph handshaking lemma. But on the other hand, every vertex in X has some large degree. And therefore we get a lower bound on, on the number of edges. So just kind of do it greedily, but make sure that you don't saturate any vertex too much. And as long as you didn't saturate more than half of the vertices, then this 
super saturation tells you there is another edge, another edge, another edge. And once you get to half of the vertices, then you cannot do it anymore. But actually, you realize that you're already happy. So, and kind of since we're running low on time, let's say that. Uh, this is uh, this gives a proof of uh, of the theorem. Was this uh, sufficiently convincing for you? Uh, okay. So now. Let's check the, so let's look for the best, the best parameter B for the theorem. Our lemma guarantees that the max degree is at most six times the number of edges divided by the number of vertices, which means we take we can take k equals six in the theorem. The only two things that we need to check are delta two, which is supposed to be at most b times sorry b over a times the number of edges divided by the number of vertices and delta three, which is B over A squared, sorry, the number of vertices is A times the number of edges divided by the number of edges. And we know that this is one, and we know that it's enough we can upper bound it by M and then upper bound M by this. And we also have a lower bound on the number of edges. So it is enough So it's enough to show that M is at most B over A times C prime A to the four divided by N to the six. times A and two, one is at most B over A squared times C prime A to the four, again, divided by M to the six times A. So this is equivalent to saying that B is at least m to the seven uh, divided by <clears throat> a squared, and this is c prime. Ah, c prime, and here the b squared is at least m to the six divided by a. A, a and also c prime. And we also know that a is at least a m to 
a over three, because once the size of the set a is m of, is m to the a over three, then we just finish the argument. We're happy with the size of the container. So, uh, so we know that this is um, no more than m to the eighteen over three c prime times m to the a over three which is m to the 10 over three divided by c prime. And we know that this is m to the 21 over three divided by c prime times m to the 16 over three, which miraculously m5 to five over three divided by a constant and here we also have b squared n to 10 over 3. So it's enough to take b to be n to the 5 over 3. And why is it good? Because it means at every step, we get a family of containers. So the number of containers each of size at most, say n to eight over three plus epsilon is exponential in <laughs> n to five over three times log n squared. Now, is it less than equal than or greater than m greater less than equal than? Excuse me. Is it is a m less than equal than uh, the number and uh, one less than equal than? Is it going to be m greater equal than? Here, the, uh, the left side. Is it? Uh, it this is the condition. So because we know that delta two is at most m, and we need delta two to be at most that, so it's enough that m is at most that. Um, right. Oh, this is a sufficient. This is a sufficient condition. If you if you check this, because what you're interested in is this inequality. So, can you finally, what is the probability that f of r is at least, say, n to five thirds plus two epsilon? This is the bound that we're interested in. What's the probability that our random set contains a set such in general position of size n to five thirds plus two epsilon? Well, if it contains such a set and we build these containers for, for all the sets in general position, then we can union bound over all the containers which will cost us n to five thirds log n squared. Times the probability that something goes wrong in a container. But every container has at most n to a thirds plus epsilon. Points. And we keep each point with probability n. To minus one. <clears throat> Sorry, I will change it to minus epsilon over two. So minus one minus epsilon over two. And we want this to exceed m to five thirds plus two epsilon. Well, the expectation here is m to five thirds plus epsilon over two. 
So this is much, much larger than the expectation. And the probability that you're much larger with the, the expectation is at most exponentially smaller than the expectation, which is n to five thirds plus two epsilon. So this probability is exponentially smaller than n to five thirds plus the epsilon over two, but the union bound is only exponentially large in n to five thirds times the log. Uh, so this means that the union bound works. I'm really sorry that I made a complete mess of this board, but I, I really wanted to finish on time. So just to recap, and what did we do? We looked at the collinear three tuples in the integer grid M cubed. We took a random subset of it and some elementary but tedious calculation shows that there's not too many collinear four tuples in there. So if we keep every point with probability less than one over N, then in the set that we see the number of four tuples is very, very small, which means that we can keep 99% of the points so that we have no four tuples. However, there's in every subset of size, at least n to eight thirds, we have so many collinear three tuples that we are able to apply the hypergraph container theorem to this hypergraph, or actually a carefully chosen sub-hypergraph, to find a collection of containers of size at most exponential and n to five thirds roughly. Now we do it for the entire grid. We get a collection of containers which each of say size one over a thousand, and we iterate and iterate and iterate and iterate log n times until we hit this barrier of n to eight thirds. But this n to eight thirds is already sufficiently small to say that the probability that any that our random set catches more than n to five thirds points is so small that uh, this can win the union bound against the containers. And it's, well, I'm already 40 seconds over. So I'm uh, sorry, and, uh, but also thank you for your attention and for attending uh, for the last five days. And moreover, I think this is the perfect opportunity to thank our wonderful host, Hong Liu, for bringing us all here together and spoiling us with lunches and, and donuts and, and many other things. So uh, thank you very much, Hong. Thank you, Rick. Very